Okay. We'll talk a little bit more track later, but we've got a big topic. It's been a big topic on the Let's Run message boards, big topic on Strava. I thought this was really interesting. CJ Albertson. Now, I'm sure if you were listening to this podcast, you remember him from last year's Boston Marathon. He led the first 20 miles, wound up finishing 10th in 211. He's pretty famous for some of his other feats of endurance. He set the 50,000 world best on the 50,000 meter world best on the track a few years ago. He has also run a 209 marathon on his treadmill. And now he's in the news again because at the Modesto Marathon on Sunday morning, well, I guess I'll read his tw- his Strava post here because that gives you a bit of, a bit better context as to what happens. He said, "Lead bike took me on a 400 meter plus detour to make sure I didn't PR in practice and get get trashed on the message boards." Thanks for looking out. They're still going to shred me though. 22 days till Boston, unofficial 26.2 split, 210.28. So, I, what I like about CJ is he's very like I told him at the Boston Marathon last year after the race and he joked the reason he led the first 20 miles was to give us a message board posters something to talk about he knows it gets a lot of attention so he takes all this stuff with good stride we he doesn't take the typical approach to running but he does get some pretty impressive results and this most recent race i thought was really it's interesting because this course it was like two miles into the race not even two miles the lead bike you're supposed to take a left-hand turn and then take another left-hand turn and continue with the race. And the lead bike, instead of taking that first left-hand turn, it goes up one extra block and then they turn left and they turn left. So CJ did not run, he didn't cover this one section of the Modesto Marathon, but he essentially ran the same stretch one block later, plus the extra distance that he had to run to run that section. So he did not, he ran more than the full distance of the race. He crossed the finish line first, yet after the race, he was DQ'd. He said he never received an explanation, was never told he was DQ'd. He also said they stopped posting his splits on the timing mats. And he was saying, well, yeah, he must have run off course. He wasn't hitting the timing mats. He says, no, he actually did hit the timing mats. He's got video evidence. They just stopped recording his splits on the race website. For some reason. So if this was a huge race, it would probably be a much bigger controversy. But it's the Modesto Marathon and the winner of the actual official winner of the race posted on the message board thread after the fact. And he said the winning prize was a nondescript plastic water bottle. No prize money or no and no trophy. So CJ doesn't seem to think it's that big a deal. But I guess first of all, I'm interested in your takes. This seems like should he be DQ'd in this situation? And second of all, what do you think of him splitting 210-28 for the marathon three weeks ahead of Boston? Of Boston? 210-28 is what he had on his watch, or that's what he actually crossed? No, that's what he had on his watch for covering the first 26.2 miles. I think they don't have an official time because he's listed as DQ'd, but his Strava entry says 212 for 26.58 miles. So I'm assuming what the what showed up on his on the clock as he crossed the line was probably something in the 212 range, which was still well ahead of sec- of the official winner in 241. So he's supposed to go up and go left, and then left again, and he went an extra block and went left, so he ran too far. Yes, I don't think that's a DQ. If you go to the next block over, you're allowed to run extra distance. That, that, yeah, you know, I mean it. it, it do I get DQ'd if, I, if I'm put in lane one, but I run in lane eight? No. This is basically what it is, right? I think so. And I actually, CJ, you know, he messaged me on, I was messaging him on Instagram to f- get to the bottom of this. And I was saying, well, yeah, te- I mean, technically you didn't run the, mar- the, the marked course, but then he said, you know, he crossed the finish line, he did everything else, and he was wondering, he's like, he wanted to know what the official rule was. So, he looked it up and he said, USATF rule 243.4 says any competitor who has been found by the referee or judge to have gained an unfair advantage by intentionally shortening the route, shortening the route of the race, cutting the course, shall be immediately disqualified from competition. But that's not what he did. He, he said, you know, it's essentially it's not like a cross-country course 
where you've got to stay between these two lines. I don't know. Maybe it is. I don't know exactly how the rule works, but in this situation, it doesn't really see it's, you know, I feel like it shouldn't have been a DQ. He ran extra distance. He basically ran the same street. It was just, it's not like the other street he ran was like some huge downhill or something that gave him a big advantage. It was very early in the race and he still won by a ton. First props to CJ and the runner up, John, for acknowledging the message boards. But should he be DQ'd? I don't really think so. I can see why they did it. But imagine this is like the New York City Marathon or something. And I don't know, you're, there's some part of New York City and you, you turn left on 68th Street instead of 67th Street. And it's because the race screwed up and you beat everybody. You should be the winner of the race. So the plastic water bottle should be CJ's. I mean, that's all I know. The other controversy I want to have is I'm shocked this race is not in Race Results Weekly. A rare mistake by David Monte. I just searched for it. The runner-up must have a name. I want this guy to get his name. I mean, the winner, who should be the runner-up, first of all, he needs to give up the water bottle. We need a, we need a lawyer to take this case pro bono. <laughs> and a lawsuit needs to be filed. This is an outrageous case the more I think about it. But I also would like to talk about, is this a good idea? This guy had better break 210 in Boston. Or I'm going to be disappointed. Like, wait, wait. Try- I, I have breaking news here, Robert. Can we put on the breaking news soundtrack? This is actual breaking news and not like, you know, the bullshit that you use it for. I'm on the race website. I was looking up the official winner's name. It's David Yacht, except on the website, he's not listed as the official winner anymore. It now lists CJ Albertson, first place, 212.08. So, Seems like the organizers have changed their mind. Maybe the water bottle. I hope it's in the mail. 2.12.08, the official time. C.J. Albertson first. David Yacht of Walnut Creek second, 2.41.28. Wow. The world has not lost it. I thought I was afraid the world was going completely insane. There's hope for the rest of the world. And I just want to shout out David Yacht. Second place, he's 41 years old. Third place in this race, James Scanlani, 52. The top seven finishers, except for outside of CJ, the top seven finishers were all 37 years old or older, and all of them broke three hours. So I'm impressed. 241 at 41, 247 at 52. That's pretty, that's pretty good. Guess I'll be running the Modesto Marathon some point soon. Okay, CJ. Some people think it's crazy that he does this shit, but what do you guys think? I think it's CJ being CJ. I think he needs to do this type of stuff. It's just part of who he is to train well. I mean, maybe you could tame the beast a bit. What if he went out and ran 20 miles instead of 26? But with super shoes these days, is it really going to hurt his performance? I mean, maybe this time he gets it right and runs even better in Boston. This is the self-proclaimed best downhill runner in the world, right? Yeah. Now, the, look, the criticism here, I think if you're a critic of CJ, you would point to 2020 when just ahead of the marathon project, he runs 209.58 on the treadmill. Now you can argue, okay, maybe there's no wind resistance, whatever. It's a little easier. But, and then he ends up running two, at that race, I'm like, okay, he's good. The marathon project, it's ideal conditions, good field. He'll definitely break 210. And then he kind of disappoints there. He only runs 211.18. So, that would be the critic's perspective. I, I, I'm I, kind of with Weldon, though. I think it's CJ. He's found something. Look, is he the best marathon in the United States? No, but he's among them. He was, what, seventh at the Olympic trials? He's had some pretty good results. I view it as sort of an American Yuki Kawuchi, Yuki Kawuchi you know? If he changes to do a more traditional system, is he suddenly going to be the best in the country? I'm not sure. I I think he's found a system where he can get pretty good results. And when you do run something like 210 in practice, it's going to create more expectations. I don't think it's a total failure if he doesn't break 210 in Boston because you've got to see what the conditions on race day are going to be like, how the race plays out. But I, yeah, I don't know. I feel like this is a system, he's gotten better results than 99% of American marathoners. So... 
I don't really see he needs to make any drastic changes, but what do I know? CJ deserves props just like this race. The fact that we spent we're spending ten minutes talking about him is amazing. You guys realize how bad he was in college? Or maybe how bad the coaching in Arizona State was when he went there. I, I don't know which is, which is the case, but this guy was never made NCAs. 1350, 5,000, 845 in the steeple. What do you mean? That sounds pretty good to me, actually. Back in the day? Back in 2017. Well, he was top 20 in Pac 12s once in cross country. He was 19th. So you would not expect someone like that to be seventh in the Olympic trials in 2020. So. Anyways. Yeah. If you had asked me if he was seventh in the Olympic trials, I would have said no. So he obviously does more than just these publicity practices. I don't know what you want to call them. I don't think he's doing it for the publicity. I think it's kind of cool. Yeah. He likes doing it. And look, he was 10th in Boston last year in 211.44. I don't think anyone can say, wow, he bombed. That's a te- That was a good result, okay? And he led most of it, and people would say, oh, he was silly for leading it. But, like, 211-44 in Boston, 10th place, that's pretty solid showing. I expect he'll run well this three weeks from now because I think he does – there is a method to his madness. Does that mean he's going to be winning or finishing on the podium? No, but he's going to be one of the top Americans in that race. I'm pretty confident of that. He's stuck in that 211 range, though. The hills really don't affect him. 211.49 at the Hilly Trials. 211.18 at the Marathon Project. 211.44 in Boston. So, we better. I think you could argue he's putting all these races together. It's only a matter of time before, you know, he gets in a, fa- in a fast environment on a good day and actually pops one. And the counter argument to that would be like, yeah, well, he didn't do it in the Marathon Project. But even guys who race a lot have bad days. So... I do think he's I think he's certainly capable of running a legit two oh nine. Whether it'll be in Boston, maybe not, but you know, put him in a fast course, I wouldn't be shocked to see that. When you say legit, you you consider a shoe, a race in a super shoe is legit or do you Yes. This isn't twenty sixteen, Robert, where this where we should be throwing people out of races according to you. <laughs> 